Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining. I can see that we've still got a few more people joining the call. Um, uh, thanks very much for joining today. I think we've got uh, people from pretty much all over the, the, the globe, um, which is great. It would be fantastic for us if, uh, if you'd pop into the chat at some point during the call uh, and, and just tell us where you're joining from. It's always interesting for us to see and for others to see uh, where their colleagues on this call are joining from. Um, my name's Tim Bean. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer for VSNI. Um, fortunately, you won't be hearing much from me today. Um, the subject of today's uh, demonstration is fitting a multi-trait model with AS Remel R. And I'm pleased to say that um, our very own Dr. Salvador Jezan uh, will be hosting today and taking us through uh, that particular presentation. Um, for those of you who don't know Salvador, uh, Salvador is a, a statistical genetics consultant here at VSNI. Um, in the past, he's been the Associate Professor of Biometrics and Quantitative Genetics at the University of Florida. Um, he reliably tells me that he's been working with AS Remel um, for more than 15 years. Uh, so, um, and he, he's, he's involved in the development of the product on an ongoing basis, and is also the driving force behind some of the other products um, that we make freely available through VSNI, for example, ASR Genomics and ASR Triola. If you haven't seen those, do go to the VSNI website to uh, check them out later. Um, so I think you'll all agree we're in very safe hands with Salvador. Um, he tells me the, his demonstration is going to take somewhere in the region of uh, 40 to 45 minutes. Um, there's a chat section. Uh, please do go there, add any comments or add any questions that you might have as we go along. Um, we'll save those up for a Q&A session at the end, uh, uh, but I know sometimes it's, it's easier to, uh, to, to jot them into the chat um, as and when you, uh, you think of them. And, and uh, Amy will be taking a look at that um, as we go through. Uh, just as a quick reminder, we are recording today's webinar um, and we will be sending that out to you afterwards uh, via email. And we would encourage you to share it with anyone you think it would be uh, of interest too. So with no further ado, I shall hand over to our host, uh, Salvador. Thank you. Well, um, thank you, Tim. Uh, hello, everybody. I should say good morning, good afternoon, and good night, depending on where you're coming from. Um, so it, today I'll be talking about uh, multi-trade models, and I will show you a real data set um, in R. And I will be discussing a little bit of the theory, but mainly what I will be presenting will be some tricks and how to face the problem of a multi-trade model. And a few of my tricks, uh, a few of other tricks that I've been learning over, over the years to try to make this uh, sort of complex model to fit, to converge uh, successfully. And of course, I'll be using AS Remel. In this case, will be AS Remel R. And again, um, the data set and the presentation and the PowerPoint presentation all be available to you if you want to play a bit more, including the code also in R. So let me just get started. I'm going to share my screen, particularly for the presentation. Uh, hopefully you can all see that. Um, so um, again, if just not only for now, but if later you need to contact me, this, this is the best way to get through me, uh, through the email directly at uh, VSNI. That's, that's where I'm based now. Um, so a few little things about multi-trait and multivariate models, which are actually connected. Um, so if, if you recall, we normally do univariate analysis, uh, univariate linear mixed models, where we analyze a single variable at the time, let's say yield, uh, or some um, lodging or some other variable of interest for us. And, um, and lately, you probably have heard in different manuscripts and, and, and different presentations, the advantages of uh, combining the data from several traits all together into the same analysis. Um, and again, this in theory is very doable, um, but in practice it presents a lot of problems because you are estimating too many components, so many variance components, and obviously you have to put together all the variables into the same place 
to fit a model. So in reality, it becomes a little bit of a mix of art and technique to try to get this model to converge. But let me just first talk about a few of the advantages of these multivariate or multi-trait models. Obviously, it's a more efficient way to combine information from several variables. And this is because usually two different traits have some form of correlation. Um, not only phenotypic correlation, but you will have some genetic correlation because of this pleiotropy that genes that act in one gene act in the other gene. And that's very important to use and to exploit because in one sense, the precision of the breeding value for trait one will be affected by the precision of the breeding value on trait two if those two traits are correlated. And you can imagine what happens when you have, let's say, eight or 10 traits like shown in the figure here everybody's going to contribute a little bit and then therefore the precision is going to increase. So that's what we have in the second point. There's an improvement on the precision of the random effects being breeding values or being clonal values or total genetic value, whatever you're looking for. There's always going to be a precision whenever the correlation between traits is uh, different than zero. Um, there is also a few things that are very relevant, and this is the multivariate analysis per se is very good to handle missing data. So sometimes you might have, for example, one trade where a rep had to be eliminated because of some difficulties on the field for measurement something. But before that, you had other measurements for the same individuals that were not lost. Let's say that rep was dropped because something happened in the lab but you still have the yield on the field and you might have other measurements in the field. So this missing data that occurs, it's very nice to handle into a multivariate analysis because now you have this sharing of information between what something that is missing is going to borrow information from the others. So it increases the precision of the one where you have that problem. The same thing happens with missing data at other fashions, you know, deer ate some of the plants or a tractor went over the field or something. Um, so because we have other information, we can complement that. So this, again, very important. It's also relevant on the cases where you can do for a secondary trade, you do a sample of the original individuals that you had on the field or you had um, on a lab. And that sample, if it's non-random sample, uh, sorry, if it's a completely random sample, um, then you will have um, also a good way to kind of complement the information. Um, now, one thing I have there is when you have calling, and calling means when you eliminate those individuals that are, tend to be bad because um, you don't want to have them for a second measurement or a later measurement, let's say their initial growth was very poor. When you do that, you tend to bias the various components because those individuals or those families that have bad individuals tend to be eliminated and later on they're not present. So it looks like they are missing at random, but in reality they are missing because there were uh, some genetic reasons. So in that case, it is critical, critical that you do a multi-trait analysis between the first measurement and the second measurement when you have this calling. Otherwise, you get bias parameters on all elements, not only BLAPs, but also on terms of variance components and so on. And then the other thing that is very good, as I mentioned, is important. Multivariate analysis allows to combine information from different sources. And what I mean here is you might have eventually a study where individuals from a group of parents were tested in the lab for, let's say, a disease, and they were tested on the field. Now, you can analyze these two sources of information as a multi-trade model. Now, the genetics are going to be correlated, but the error terms are not correlated because, obviously, they are in different parts. So that, that also brings a new um, array of different models to consider. So, and then we have all the elements that we think about, not only like the statistical advantages, but all these other genetic applications for which when we want to use the results from a multi-trade or a multivariate analysis. Um, so for example, we can correlate, we can estimate all these genetic correlations between the traits, not only the phenotypic, but particularly the, the genetic correlations are very important. And you might uh, remember a bit that this is, in, this is very relevant for those um, cases where we want to see what happens on the indirect selection of one trait over the other. So if we focus on some traits, we want to see if that improvement is going to diminish what happens with the other traits or is going to push the other traits together with the main traits we're using. So that's very important. 
Um, obviously, we can predict performance of individuals that we have only measured for one trait and not for the other. As long as there is some correlation, we'll get an estimation of breeding value for the missing individuals uh, for the secondary trait that we are actually analyzing. So that's very, again, very important because we don't have everybody on a disease panel, but we can still predict some level of breeding values in that case, if we have a pedigree or if we have a genomic matrix. Now, if you are familiar with selection index, the correlations on the phenotypic responses and the correlations on the genomic or genetic responses are used to build this matrix algebra for the selection index, which is important. Um, so more of this is uh, present on the literature for animal breeding, but it has uh, emerged lately in plant breeding too. And I mentioned the last one already is what happens with indirect selection, again, assessing what happens with this correlation from one side to the other. So now the theory, it is a bit complicated, but I'll, I'll, I'll explain a little uh, idea to give you the concept. And then again, you can review this or if, if you send me an email, I can direct it to other literature. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fit a linear mix model with a group of fixed effect, which is the beta, and a group of random effects, which is the G, for a given response variable that I analyze. So in this reddish color that you have here, it refers to one trait, let's say uh, yield. <clears throat> and then obviously when we fit that model, we're going to have breeding values or genetic values in terms of G, uh, it's T genotypes, and the beta represents, for example, replicates or covariates or something. Now we also have the blue um, trait in this, let's assume, for example, this is sugar content. Um, so we know these two traits might be correlated. And again, this is a completely different trait, and we have a different set of genetic values and also beta effects or rep effects and also error effects for each of these um, uh, yeah, units. So what we're going to assume here is we have exactly the same individual measure for the two traits, yield and sugar content, and we want to feed a model that combines them together. So the easiest way to understand this is to stack the vectors of the response variables. As you see here, 1 through n is the first uh, trait, and then one through n is a second trait. So I just differentiate them by colors, but they're not identical. And then we have a mu for the first trait and the beta effects associated with replicate for the first trait and the same thing for the second trait. Now you can see here that I have two X matrices that are going to be identical, but one of the X for the first trait and the other one is going to be for the second trait. If I have a slightly different number of fixed effect between one trait and the other trait, let's say, for example, one of them didn't have rep, then my X will change for the red one and might be just a vector of one if I only have a mu or if I have other terms. So that's why they are a bit differentiated. And then we have the same thing happening with the G matrices, and in this case with the G vector. Um, so we have Z and C, blue and red, or reddish, um, again, to identify the association between the genetic effects with the data. And we have the errors specifically for each of those. Now, the important thing here in our multi-trade model is that there is two correlations that need to be modeled. The genetic effect of individual one for trade one it's correlated with the same genetic effect of the same individual, but on the second trait. So sugar content and yield are going to be correlated between the same two individuals, so their breeding values. And I know this is a negative correlation. How strong it is, I don't know, but that's what I'm analyzing the data. And also the errors are going to be correlated. And why is that? It's because the error corresponds to the unexplained phenotypic part. Uh, and obviously we are talking about the same experimental unit. So if it happens to be good for one thing, it's probably going to be also good for another thing or consistently good for one and bad for the other. So we need to model this sort of double correlation between the errors and between the effects. I'm going to show you how do we do this for the genetic effects. So we use something called the Kronecker product to, to define the structure of these models. Remember what I'm trying to do is define G1 through GT and G1 through GT for the second trait. And I need to say that G1 and G1 are correlated. So this is what I'm doing here. I'm defining a vector of G1s that are in this case a diagonal matrix and another diagonal matrix for the twos. This should be a two here. And then we have the one, two covariances and the one, two covariances between these two. So what we do is we multiply this A2 matrix by, um, in this case, is 
pass multiply by an identity matrix to give me an expanded. So this will be shit sigma square G1, this should be sigma square G2, and the covariances between the two on the off diagonal. So how am I going to do that? Um, we use AS Remol R. Um, again, if you're familiar with AS Remol R, you, that's how you got here, probably. Um, it has tremendous flexibility to fit uh, an, a, a bigger rate of linear models and uh, repeated measures and balanced data uh, incorporating genetics and pedigree files and so on. And it has two qualities, which is uses the average information, which makes it run very fast. Um, and that's the algorithm for estimating the variance components. And we use the sparse matrix operation, which is kind of associated with the Kronecker product that I just showed you. So it's quite flexible, but again, it could be a bit more complicated to analyze. So I'm just going to get started a little bit with the code. Um, so um, hopefully you can see my screen. I imagine you can. Um, I was asked to allow the chat. Um, so if anybody has some questions, can you please put your question in the Q&A and because we don't have the chat uh, enabled, okay? So I'm going to start with my R code. Um, I'm going to read my data here. Um, I have it in my folder, loading the library for R, and you see I have everything kind of clear. And I'm going to use one data set that is present on the library, I agree that, which has a nice array of data sets. Um, there's specifically a data set from MACE, uh, which is a multi-trade environment, but I'm only going to use one of the environments. So this is multiple trials and in multiple environments. And we have several things measured, and I'll come back to those, but what we care most about is the replicate, the genotype, and a group of response variables. If you need some more information at the end, you have the source for this data set. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select only an specific environment, 2010 WD, and I'm getting rid of a few columns so we don't have too much of a confusion. And um, I can show you a few bits of the data. So this is how the data is looking. We have the rep, the genotype, and we have these five response variables that are of interest for us to estimate into a multi-trace. So we want the correlation between them, days to flower, plant height, ear height, lodge, moisture, and yield. And we know some things are correlated and some things are not too correlated. And notice that we have lodge as a, per, as, as a number um, between zero and 100, and days to flowering is obviously days. So some of these are discrete and some of them are continuous. So it's a bit of a mix of things. Before I move forward, I'm going to do the reps and the genotypes as factors. And um, once these are set up as, as factors, I can again get a summary of my data and you can see uh, on each of these, I have four reps. I have 170 some genotypes. These two, we have different, uh, the different traits with different ranges and so on. That you see, one of the things I want to mention here is we have different values between the minimum and the maximum. And this is going to be relevant for the multi-trait. For example, this one goes from 198 to 269. And the scale of this is very different than the scale of this one that goes from zero to 38 or 11 to 18. So when the, because we want to fit a multi-trade model, we have to kind of assess if the scaling of the different variables is more or less similar. Otherwise we might have to transform one variable from one thing to another. For example, if plant height, which in this case is 10 centimeters, I divided it by 100, I will have it in meters, which goes from one to two. That's on a scale that will be more similar to the scale of Lodge. So it might help us again to make the model converge. So that's one of the tricks. But anyway, so the other thing I do here is the table. I'm going to go up a little bit. This is just for me to help me see if each genotype is on each um, rep, and I have that they are perfectly in each rep. I have some genotypes replicated more times, which happen to be the checks, and the rest is replicated only once on each of them. So that's a perfectly balanced. We still have a, might have NA observations and so on. So let me just do a little bit of my exploration. So this is a correlation matrix, and we can see some interesting correlations. For example, yield and height is quite a high correlation in this case. 
0.4. There are some negative correlations between plant high and days to flower, minus three here. So well, that's that's good. Again, remember these are linear correlations. I'm going to use a function to from ASR genomics just to give me a matrix of correlations between the traits that you can see here on the right, and they're also sorted and cluster. You can see again the whole range of some values a bit negative perfectly one and some correlation of uh, some groups of traits and then their group. Again, this can help to identify if there's any, any, any interesting issue or not. But I'm still exploring my data. So I have this little function here, panel histogram, which is going to create a panel. So don't worry too much about it. Uh, what it's important is once you run that function, I can call it on this line of code and you will see directly this uh, panel, which has everything together. So I'm going to make this one a bit big. Hopefully you can see it. Um, so let me just make it um, this. <clears throat> um, so in this particular case, uh, you can see the, the kind of like the correlation between trites. So this is plant height and yield. We have a positive correlation. We have another positive correlation. We have some noise in between the different traits. And some of them don't seem to have a really clear correlation with a bit of noise. Notice what happens with days to flower. Days to flower is a discrete, sort of a discrete variable because it only was happening in five different time points or five different days. So that might create some conflicts uh, so that we also need to kind of consider. The other thing I find interesting is yield seems to have two peaks and also lodge seems to be kind of like a J distribution, maybe in this case, more like a Poisson, where we may have to change something and how that it goes with a concentration on the lower values. So that might leave us to do something. Now, somebody asked if, if we need to do a, a standardization of this data. Um, it does help. Um, it actually will not affect your changing your variance component matrix into a correlation matrix. But it creates a bit of a distortion because now everything is in the standardized values that you have to back transform. So in general, I don't do on standardization. I, in general, what I do is I rescale things. So like I mentioned, changing height to from, from centimeters to meters or grams to milligrams or inches to feet or so, depends on what you have. And sometimes just an arbitrary multiplication by 10. So I like to keep the sort of like the natural scale of the data. Um, but standardization has helped in the past. So this plot tells me that there's something going on. And then it tells me a little bit about the noise. So it helps to just to know what to expect. I mentioned, do we need a transformation maybe for one of the variables? And the transformation not only will necessarily help in making that variable more like normally distributed, but it will also might help to make that variable more linearly correlated with the rest of the variables. So that might be something interesting. I haven't tested with the lodge, but if you have some data set, you might want to try to evaluate a transformation, which will still leave you with a correlation, which is always going to be in a linear fashion. Um, so, Another thing I like to see, and again, this is where I, I talk about the standardization in these two lines, I'm calculating the mean and the standard deviation of this data. And you can see the means are in relatively different scales. Maybe plan height really is the only one that kind of sticks out a little bit too far off. Maybe I should divide it by 10, uh, not by 100 and do it in deci, um, decimeters. And then you also have the variances, which uh, in this particular case, sometimes also give you an idea of very different variances, then that means it's going to give you an issue. The reason why it is that is that think about you're estimating a correlation or a, cor a correlation matrix between two traits and one has very large values and the other one has very small values. The value on the off diagonal or the covariance could almost be anything because it'll be a covariance multiplied multiply by two va values on the square root of the two values. So if one is very large and the other very small, maybe the multiplication will be very small or maybe the multiplication will be very large. So you are almost on the realm of sort of like the precision of the data, okay? So that's that's a little bit what I, um, uh, it can be done, okay? Now, um, 
So I'm going to proceed to fit my model. This is a very simple model. I will assume my replicate effect is a fixed effect, just for simplicity, uh, but you can have a mix of replica, uh, fixed effects and random effects in complete blocks, whatever you have. And I have my genotype in this case is going to be a random effect for obvious reasons. So the first step on my strategy of fitting a multi-trait is always to focus first on the univariate model and analyze every variable individually, clean them for outliers, actually calculate a heritability. And if they have a heritability of zero, there's no point on having that trade involved in the multi-trade because first it's going to create instabilities, but second, there's nothing to gain from in terms of genetic from that trade. Uh, you can see also with the receivable plots, you can see if they need a transformation, uh, eliminate, as I mentioned, eliminate some outliers, and also you will have, if you have a complex model with several random effects and fixed effects, you can assess the significance of some of them. For example, you might have an incomplete block that happens to be zero, and that might mean that you don't need to incorporate into the model. So you need to consider those elements later on when you do your multi-trade because that variance is expected to be around zero. So let me just um, analyze one of these traits. Um, I'm going to... Uh, I start with the lodge that I'm suspicious, suspicious that needs a transformation. So I just loaded the variable into Y and I'm going to run my model with AS Remo where I specify fix is equal to Y, uh, which in this case is lodge, tilde rep, that's a fixed effect, random genotype. And then I just put a residual term that just tells me, please make all my experimental units independent from each other, which is their basic assumption that we use for the receivable terms. So when I run this, obviously it doesn't take too long. I can assess my plot and you can see a bit of issues here, potentially outliers. The distribution is not really uh, perfectly aligned with the QQ plot. I do have some variance components, uh, 23 for the genetics, 32 for the error. And then I can calculate a heritability using the function B predict. And then you can see here the heritability is 0.42, which seems very reasonable with a relatively low approximated standard error. And I can get some predictions if I was interested or not. So this is one of those traits that might need some transformation. I'm just going to show you, I'm not going to use the transformation, but I can just show you how to do it. I'm going to use log of y plus 10, which I already tested. The plus 10 is to get away from the zeros. And I rerun the model. And you see the receivable plots now are looking much more reasonable. Uh, again, you're dealing now with a transform variable. The variance components obviously are going to be on the scale of the transform variable. And I get another heritability, which is 0.66, which happens to be lower than before. No, actually, it happens to be a bit higher than before. Okay. Now, is this transformation going to correlate better with the other traits? I'm not sure, but I just wanted to show you that you can uh, assess uh, uh, this way. The other thing I want to show you is yield. Uh, in yield, uh, you see an outlier. Uh, so I'm proceeding to eliminate the outliers on these lines. This is a bit of code to eliminate the outliers. So I found one in moisture and one in yield. So they are eliminated now. So when I do yield again, um, you'll see that the plot looks a lot more reasonable with that observation out of the equation. Again, it's a personal decision if you want to leave it or not, how much you want to assess this is up to you, but I'm just showing you. And finally, I want to show you days to flowering. Um, so days to flowering, the plot um, looks relatively reasonable, but you have these uh, lines around here because it has those uh, vertical, um, just a few measurements, but in general, it looks relatively good. Um, my heritability is 0.37, and I can get the predictions. The predictions are like the LS means, so they are the mean values for each of the genotypes because I request the means to be done by genotype. And you can see here that I have a mean for this genotype, uh, 116, 1161 Pro, 7593 is the mean value, and I have a standard error associated with that value which is 0.95, and keep that on mind because I'll come back to it, okay? Um, so let me just go back a little bit to, no, not yet to the, to the slides yet, but um, so one thing that is very important on these models to help the convergency of a more complicated model is to have some starting values, 
So what I pull out here is from each one of these analyses that I did here on each of trait, I, I pull out the genetic variance and the error variance. So you can see, for example, for um, in this case is, um, what was the days to flower? I have a genetic variance of 3.05, which is this 3.1, and then 5.07, which is this 5.1. So I store some of the numbers in there to use as a starting value. This helps the system to find the overall solution. Again, important that the scales are not too different. And now I can proceed to fit my model. Uh, I'm going to start with a bivariate model. In the bivariate, I'm only going to define two traits. Uh, you can see here, and I can, I can show you um, a little bit how I tend to think about constructing this model. So I'm going to take the univariate model just to show you how the logic goes behind. Um, I'll do it in here. So I have my, let's say my bivariate model that I'm going to fit. Now I have two traits. So when you go fix equal to the trait, we use the command directly C bind. And I'm going to use days flowering, comma, yield. So uh, you put as many traits as you need on this um, C bind. So it's going to stack down the vectors. Okay. And then you say, well, each of these two models that I'm fitting here has its own mean, its own mu. So we have a reservoir called trait, which is a reservoir within AS Remel that actually what we'll do is we'll create a new factor with level one for the first trade, level two for the second trade, level three for the third trade, and so on. Then I have replication, and replication is not, it's a replication that depends on each of the traits. So what we do is we define it as nested effect, rep within trait. That means it's going to be a rep effect one on trade one, and a rep effect one on trade two, and as many traits as you have. So then you keep the independence from them. Then we have to define what happens with the genotypes. So the best way to think again is trait genotype. So that means we have a genetic effect one on trait one and so on. Now we leave it like that. We are going to assume all this combination of effects or this nested effect of genotype within trait is going to be independent from each other, which is not the case. We do know the genotypes are independent, so we can write, actually, I'm going to write ID, which means we have an identity matrix, as I showed earlier. But traits are not going to be, the two observations from the same genotype on the two traits are not going to be independent, and we have different structures. So this is where we use, for example, a core GH. A core GH is going to be a special structure, and I'll show you to you in a sec, that we're going to use to model this. Now, the next thing is the residuals. The residuals are not independent from each other. So we need to define them in a correlated way. So what we do is we can say again, core GH of trait. Now it goes the other way around. We put trait at the end because of the way the data is sorted internally in ASREML. And I need to delete this ID because we have an identity for the units, each observation, um, it's, it's uh, independent from each other for a given trait, but between the traits, there is some correlation. And that will be my model, okay? So I'm just going to comment it out because we have it already written below. But I want to go back to the slides for a sec. So this is when we do the bivariate analysis in AS-REML, we define this matrix of correlation, sigma squared G1, sigma squared G2, and the covariance between one and two. This is for this is for um, one genotype on trait one and trait two. So it's not for two genotypes. It's the same genotype in both of. So it's the genotype GI on both of the traits. So this will be the variance, genetic variance associated with taste to flowering, genetic variance associated with yield, and the covariance between yield and um, days to flowering, which we can parameterize not only as a covariance, but also as a correlation, which is what I'll show you. So I mentioned already most of these things. You can, you have the reservoir trait and we can use different structures within AS-REML. This one particularly is the US or an instructor, but I use the core GH because it's a parameterization that uses correlation and I tend to like it a bit better. And it's actually recommended because it forces the correlation to be between minus one and 
plus one. So it tends to be a bit more stable in that sense. If you it finds it has little information for the correlation, it tends to be lost. It pushes us back within the parameter space. So we have different structures that we can use. I sh I, the ID is the um, identity variance where there is just ones, and this is what we use for the genotypes. They're independent from each other. There's diagonals when we want to allow for each trait to have a different variance. And then we have some more complicated. This is a core V, which assumes the same variance between the traits and a single correlation. But more interesting for us is this one. And think about that I have four traits each trait, remember, is four traits for one genotype. So this is the genetic variance on trait one, the genetic variance on trait two, the genetic variance on trait three and four. And then we have these correlations between one and two, one and three, one and four, and so on. This structure has 10 variance component on a matrix of four by four, which is four traits. And you can see why is it really nice, because it will give me the correlation between every pair of traits simultaneously. Um, it's hard to fit because we are asking for 10 variance component. If you have five traits, which is what I'll show you, we'll have 15 variance components, uh, but it's kind of interesting. It's the same as the unstructured, but the unstructured is just model in terms of covariances, which is what I showed you earlier, okay? So a few bits that I already have mentioned before, but again, uh, I, I kind of put here, do we need to do a standardization or scaling? Uh, some responses might need it. I remember I just talked about more like rescaling. Uh, we already use the strategy of using a univariate analysis and add one variable at a time. So sometimes people do two, then you use those as, those elements as with the starting values and do three, then you do four and so on. But in my case, I put I did all the univariate analysis and then I can I can decide how um, clean it up and so on. Initial values are critical. So again, if you do the single variable or univariate analysis at the beginning, store the variance components, use them for later. And then you need some correlations, which is what we'll put when we do the, the initial values. I don't know what the genetic correlation between um, yield and um, uh, between yield and days to flowering is, but I have some idea of the phenotypic correlation because I have the data. And then I have some idea maybe that they are positive. So I know from prior studies this is positive. Um, so you can do some things or just be a rough and say, put a small positive value, 001 or 0 0.1, and just let see the system if we will converge or not. Okay. So I will um, just fit the model to show you what happens. And this is where I go back to my code. And it's the same model as you've seen, no starting values. And this is doomed to crash, but it runs. And this is one of these cases where the two variables are measured. There's few missing values. There's little inconsistencies. Um, they tend to have, in this case, a positive correlation that is moderate. Um, so that's fine. The models are also not very complex. Remember, I only have rep effect and then the genetic effect are the only ones plus the errors. So let's see what the variance components say. And you can see here a little bit of um, elements, sorry, I just a bit, a bit of the elements of this model. Um, it seems to have run and give me a positive correlation. Let me just be a bit more safe and provide some starting values. Notice that the order of this is very important because it helps me to do the starting values. This is the correlation between the two traits. This is the genetic variance um, in terms of days to flowering, the genetic variance in terms of yield. This is a one that it's just fixed. Don't worry about it. Then there is a correlation between the, the different uh, error terms and then an error variance for days to flowering and another error variance for yield. Very different in scales in this particular case. So what I can do is I do the same. I follow a starting value for the genetic component which I use the values I have before. I need a correlation. And what's my best use of the correlation? Well, I have a matrix of correlations. So I can go back here and say the correlation between days to flowering and yield is 0 0.175. So I'm going to use that one in here. And then 3.1 was the variance from the univariate model for uh, days to flowering. And 1.8 was the genetic variance for yield on the univariate model. 
Uh, so I use those. And then you just put that vector in a G or in it R associated within your structure. Notice I put a core GH, my trait in it, and then the same thing with in it R. Again, this is so this is going to help tomorrow to converge and also is going to require fewer iterations, of course, because you're assisting the system. And then we have our variance components, we happen to be the same as before. Um, just again, interesting that we have a genetic positive correlation between the traits, we expected that, but we have a negative phenotypic or in this case, error correlation between the traits, which is not unusual and there must be a biological reason for it, but I don't know it. We can proceed to calculate heritabilities for each of the traits. So I will just take the variance of this flowering divided by the variance, genetic variance of the flowering plus the error term, 5.0a. And then um, I have a heritability of 0.37 and a heritability of 0.82 for yield, pi high for yield. This will have changed because the variance components change. And actually on days to flowering, I can go back to my code because the model I run here was days to flowering and the heritability was 0.37. So very small changes on the heritability for that trait. Now what's important here, and I, this is what I wanna show a little bit is, when I get the prediction from this bivariate model for trained genotype, I'm going to have uh, the, I'm asking for the effect of this genotype on each trait, which is, Actually, you can see here, it gives me for genotype 1161 pro and on the trait days to flowering, it gives me its predicted value and a standard error. And the same thing happens for yield and so on. And you can see here all the combination of genotypes and you can export this. Now, what is interesting here is that the standard error for the first genotype 1161 pro on days to flowering is 0.8831. Before, I haven't shown you here, but with I did the univariate analysis. I'm going to show you here. The prediction from the univariate analysis gives me 0.95. So there's almost like a 10% reduction on the, on the standard error associated with that genotype. And that is because the genetic correlation between the two traits is quite high, 0.57. And that means this trait is gaining from this multi-trait analysis, in this case, bivariate analysis. This is important. The reason for that is usually the trait with the lower heritability is the one that has the most to gain from the other traits that have high heritability and are correlated with this trait. And this is what is happening in this case. Uh, there's a much higher heritability for yield than days to flowering. And then we know the correlation is positive, 0.57. So that means that we gain. Okay, we can try try a trivariate model. In this case, I have yields, flowering, and so on. Again, this is more doomed to crash. So what I will do is I will just go directly to the multi-trait model. And notice here I'm doing days to flowering, plant height, ear height, lodge, moisture, and yield. So I put all the traits together in my multi-trait. But again, I'm going back to my slides. When we do multi-trait models, it's ideal for us to start slowly. And slowly is think that what we want is we want a core GH or a US structure. And it started slowly means maybe starting with a diagonal, maybe making a core B or a core H, making some elements core GH on, on our random part, but not all the elements core H onto a random part. And then or maybe even just working on the error terms and assuming the errors are independent and get a core GAs running with some good starting values and then move to the R structure, so on. So depending on the complexity of the model, it might take a long time. You might have to go really slow. You might have to use some, for example, diagonal structure for some of your random effects because it's very difficult to fit. Um, there's other possibilities. Uh, one of them is to use a factor analytic, which I'll show you a little bit. Um, I know I'm running a bit long time, but I'll show you just on, on the go, uh, which is a good way to approximate the core GAs structure. And one thing that is very important is that your model might, might not fit at all. So you might end up with problems and then you, that's the end of the story. It doesn't fit and then you have to rule in, in different ways. It could be problems with the data. It could be just of the complexity and the noise of the model. 
um, of, of the data, noise of the data. And, and then, as I mentioned, one strategy is sometimes just to get values, it's just to do bivariate models, trade one with two, one with three, one with four, and so on, and try to fill up the matrix that you need and, and so on. So anyway, so let me just go back to the model. This model is very ambitious and notice I'm using a diagonal structure because I'm just saying, let's assume that everything is independent and so on. And this is just for me to see if I can put it all together. And you can see here, the variance components are all put together. You have the genetic variances, but everything is independent. So this is just saying everything is independent. I can move to this diagonal or the error diagonal and slowly progress to a core GH or something in one of them and move along. Now, you can spend a long time, okay? So what I'm going to do is, um, I'm going to look at my correlations and my correlations are positive and negative, but they seem to be more slightly positive. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to change my diagonal to a core GH in both the random part and the error part. And I'm going to do the starting value where I'm saying all the correlations, the 15 correlations for every potential pair is going to be, sorry, exactly 0.2. I could pick different values, but let's see if that runs. It is doomed to mostly of the time not to run, but for whatever reason, this data set is so neat and, and, and good that it just converts on the first go. I don't have to do too much. By the way, Ace Remel has improved a little bit on their starting values and has improved a bit on their algorithm to get to this convergency, but you still might have problems. So let me look at my variance components. And now you have a lot of more variance components and look for strange things. Look for something percent change that has changed too much. This is only 0.1%, so it's not too bad. But sometimes you have much larger values saying that there's some parameters with instability. Look for bound. Some of the parameters might be a bit bound. Their correlation is too high or too low. Or some genetic variances that seem to be too close to zero that might be bound. And they could potentially be the ones that make the model not to converge. And the rest, we have just all the correlations, the 15 correlations between the pairs of traits. They look nice and positive and negative as we were expecting, relatively large standard errors. Again, in some traits more than in others. And then we have all the genetic variances and then all the uh, error correlations between the different parts of traits. So we have the 0.53 uh, between plant high and flowering. Somewhere here have days to flowering and yield is minus 0.34 and yield and um, days to flower and is 0.51, very similar to what we obtained before. It's good to look at the residual plots. They will tell you something that is going on. Uh, I have here the code for update, but the residual plot, uh, it's a bit funny because it's very hard to see everything together. But um, if everything was clean before, you shouldn't see too many surprises. So for example, here, Yes, this is large, might need a transformation, potentially a couple of layers in yield that now are highlighted, etc. There is something weird here and days to flower one observation, which is quite off the rest. Again, that's what might tell you things that you might going to assess. Everything is together, but it doesn't look too bad except for lodge that might need that transformation. And this plot here on the right is difficult to see. So what I'm just going to do is I'm just happy with my model. I'm going to get the variance components. So just follow me on this code. What I'm doing is I'm just getting the extracting the variance components and putting them into a matrix way so I can see them. Um, so you have the G matrix here, and then you have the R matrix here between uh, bison the variance components. And this is where we can see the 514 between days to flower and yield and the error correlation. And this G and R matrices, in terms of correlations or express and variance covariances, if you want them, uh, are the ones that we will use for a selection index, okay? And finally, I'm going to show you a little bit of the predictions because I fit my model with the five elements. Um, you can use likelihood ratio test to assess how good 
one model is against another one. But let me just show you what happens with a few of my predictions. And again, I have the 1161 Pro, days to flowering 75, very similar to what we obtained before. But look, the standard error went down from 0.95 to 0.88 to 0.61 in this particular case. So it's gaining a lot of more information by using and combining all that again. That has important implications on breeding. I mean, you have, you're going to have higher breeding values if you are using a pedigree because there's less shrinkage. Also, you might end up with um, a better, much more certainty. That means you might end up reducing the replication. Maybe I don't need four replicates. If I'm going to do a multi-trade, I might need to do three replicates and so on. So there is quite a lot of little bets to, um, to try to get there, okay? So I have to finish relatively soon. Um, but I just wanted to, to show you that you can approximate this with a factor analytic. The factor analytic, and I can direct you to more theory, is an approximation to a US structure that in this particular case with 10, four traits will require only eight variance components. In our case, with five will require 10 instead of the 15, a factor analytic of order one. And it tends to give a very good uh, approximation to what we need. So I'll just run this one. Um, notice that the big difference is I replace my core GH that I had before by an FA, and then I'm putting a number two here because I want it of order two. Okay, you can ask for order one, order two. It's more variance components to estimate. I'm not going to go into the detail of what is underneath the factor analytic. I also don't have the time. But one thing that is important is that the factor analytic is a very good trick to approximate your matrix, your core GH, and still allowing you to have pretty much the same information you have in case you run into a crisis and things can converge. The log likelihood value is minus 2251. In my previous model was minus 2248. So the difference is not really that much. Okay, it's a few units. Um, and the variance components are expressed in a different way in a specific variances and the loadings. Um, so what I'm going to show you again just here is the matrix of correlations between with the factor analytic, which is this, this is the variance covariance, and the old correlations that we obtained for our, for our core GH. And you can see there is a few differences but nothing too extreme. Um, in some of the cases, a bit more because the factor analytic is approximating things. You have minus 0 0.06, sorry, 0 0.06, 0 0.12, minus 34, and so on. And again, I can get my predictions and you won't see too much of a difference. So this is a good compromise to get things. Uh, if you see large differences, it's possible because there are some outliers or instability, okay? So again, um, with that, I need to finish. I have a team on the side and we don't have too many minutes, but we can allow time for some questions. Thank you very much, Salvador. That was um, <clears throat> very enlightening. Uh, yet yeah, we have lots of questions today. So what I'm going to suggest is I'll, I'll quickly run through them. If okay. you can answer them in less than 30 seconds, do so. If you think okay. it's more than a 30 second answer, what we'll commit to do is to put the answer to all of the questions into the email that we'll send out to everybody afterwards um, to make sure that we've got all those those questions in there. So yeah. first of all, um, Eagle um, asked early on in the presentation, what about min-max transformation, i.e. putting everyone to naught dash one, would this distort like standardization? Um, it is going to distort the standard the standardization. I mean, it's, it's going to help to put everything on the same and similar scale, in this case, on the same range. I do wonder what is it going to do with the breeding values, because the breeding values now will be completely re in reference to another scale. So I will probably not do it because I'm interested in the breeding value in terms of, I don't know, kilograms per hectare for yield and not something related to zero to one. OK. Hopefully, hopefully that helps. Um, Nazir asks, can we make, whoops, jump down. Nazir asks, can we make decisions based on fit statistics to add or drop variables in multivariate models? I can, can, I, uh, I'm can we make decisions based on fit statistics to add or drop variables in a multivariate model? Yes, you can. So you will have access to the ANOVA 
as a regular analysis of variance. So I can I can I can just show you in a very way. Um, so I'll do it with my with this model. So we use the world um, to assess if things should be dropped or not. It's not going to affect you much. Uh, and also, this is just an, an ova-like. I mean, it's very simple because I have it by rep and I don't have too much terms. But if you have all the covariates, yes, you can. Um, also, uh, you can use a likelihood ratio test to compare your different models. Okay. Oh, okay. I didn't. Uh, and Matthias was paying particular uh, attention because he has, uh, I think, about five questions. So I'll try and yeah. work more quickly. Um, Salvador, what if you do not include the residual equals IDV? What's the default of ASRMRR? The default will be that every single unit is independent from each other, which is not exactly what you want because you measure the same experimental unit for the five traits or as many traits as you have. For the univariate case, it doesn't make any problem because that's exactly what you want to assume. Okay. Okay, thank you. Next question from Mateus. Uh, is it possible to use factor analytic covariance to model correlation between traits? Well, I did kind of answer that towards the end. Yes, you can. And I do recommend it. Good. So, Quick next question then. How does ASRM or R calculate SE for heritability? That's a good question. And the calculation of the heritability is done by the delta method, um, which, again, it's an approximation. So you can go back to the theory of how the delta method goes. It's derivatives of the function you're transforming. OK, towards the, the end, when you, you said go slowly, build slowly, Mateus asks, what about select the best fit model based on AIC slash BIC? And then he apologizes for all the questions. We like questions, Mateus. Yeah, um, I obviously in a generic way for fitting linear mixed models, you can use the AIC and the BIC. You have to be careful that the models you compare have the same fixed effects. Um, now, I you have to be a bit um, a bit careful because what I'm trying to do here is trying to fit a multi-trade model with a complex extractor. So it's not too much about model selection. It's more like, can I get this matrix of correlations for my model? Yeah. But, but, but Mateus says he was talking about covariance modeling. Does that alter your answer? So, um, so if you're talking about covariance model, AIC, BIC is going to help you, but you can better off, let's say, if I'm comparing two covariance models, you're better off using the likelihood ratio test, which is a formal test. If the models are nested, otherwise you use an AIC, BIC. So it's possible, yes. Okay, last question from Mateus. Then we, uh, Fernando has just added a quick one, which we'll go to. Um, is it possible to fit a stage-wise multi-trait model? And if yes, this might help convergence. However, I'm not sure how the residual correlation would work. So that it's the main problem with the multi, the two stage analysis. So you can, you, you can do it in the first, you can use the first stage and then you have the weights. Um, but again, in the residual part, you cannot model the correlation between the residuals because the, the weights are absorbing the variance. So it won't be very easy. Uh, probably it's almost impossible. Now, what I've seen is people ignore the weights and then they still try to fit a two-stage analysis without the weights, which will give you to a bit of a bias components unless all the weights are very similar. So the answer is no, it's very difficult. I wouldn't recommend it. Okay, thanks. Final question before we wrap up. Do, uh, this is from Fernando. Do you have suggestions to fine tune starting values for FA2 and higher degrees? So you, the best way is to start with an FA of order one, which is always almost always going to converge. And then you use the FA of order one from, from uh, as a starting values. And then you can do, so it's, I know this is a bit of an advanced question, but let's say if I was going to go, can, can you see my screen, by the way, Tim, can you yeah. see this? Okay, so if I was going to go FA of order three, I have, this will be my my specific variances to use as a starting value. I will use this. This will be my FA1 and FA2. 
and I will use an FA3 vector as in it. Uh, in that case, I normally use something like a 0 0.1. And somewhere between numbers between 0 and 1 are very good. Uh, I don't know, don't ask me why, but then tend to be very good. And I will use a value like a 0 0.1 for everywhere. And that's how I will probably get the FA3 to try to converge. Okay. Okay. Make Great. Questions. Um, thank you very much, Salvador. Um, on behalf of everybody, we've uh, we've had participants that pretty much have stayed through. So um, that, that's a, a good thing. So thank you to everybody who's joined today. Um, thank you for all of those useful questions. As we said at the start, um, we, we've, we will send out uh, an email afterwards with a link to the recording here. Please do share it um, as widely as you think it's appropriate to do so. Apologies that we, um, we had a small technical problem with the chat. That is the first time that we've used Zoom as the platform and we put our hands up and go, ah, we didn't quite get that bit right. But hopefully next time um, we'll have got that bit resolved. And do keep your eye out uh, on the social channels for VSNI, follow us if you're not already on them, um, and the website for details of the next uh, webinar that we'll, we'll have coming up uh, very soon. And uh, yeah, that just remains for me to uh, thank you all for joining again. Thanks, Salvador, for his time and effort uh, on behalf thank of Thank you for your time and joining us too. Yeah, and enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. Thank you.